This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters. Welcome. This is Craig Thomas, your host on Much More on Medicine, part of Think Tech Hawaii's live stream series, and assisted, as always, by our engineers, Rich and Ray. Uh, with me this morning is Dr. Linda Rosen. She's the CEO of the Hawaii Health Systems Corporation, which I've heard described as the largest uh, sort of state-run care delivery system in the nation. I, there are many different definitions of large, and I suspect in terms of volume of patients treated, we're a small state, that may not be true. But in terms of variety, distribution of, and distance between uh, facilities, it might well be true. And uh, I'm delighted to have you here. I work at a number of your facilities. I work also across the state in some similar, although not part of the, the state system facilities, and I've come to appreciate them. Uh, the task of providing health services to people far removed from the uh, larger, uh, privately owned, or at least uh, maybe public, but uh, non-state affiliated facilities is a real challenge. And uh, thanks for taking it on. Thank you, Craig. I'm glad to be here. Great to have you. Would you mind describing to me and to our audience, of course, uh, sort of the mission and scope of, of what's happening? I don't think most people know. Well, you know, I think to start with, we can talk about what is a public hospital system or state hospitals. And uh, as you mentioned, we are one of the larger um, systems, depending on how you describe it. But certainly when you look at the proportion of the state's residents and communities um, that we are the primary uh, hospital provider for, it's a quite large part of the state. And we are predominantly on the neighbor islands, although we do have two long-term care facilities here on Oahu. So I think that um, for folks, perhaps it might be interesting to sort of think about why is government, you know, a state agency providing health care? That's not usually what you find, and that's why we are one of the biggest, because in most states, it's quite unusual to have government-operated facilities. Um, but in Hawaii, I think it's, it's important to kind of go back to the history of the islands and the neighbor islands, particularly with the plantations, that they provided health care, and they were predominant providers of health care, you know, back in the day in uh, many of these rural communities. <clears throat> and then, you know, when um, the plantations and sugar industry dwindled, uh, the counties started to try to step in and try to provide that health care, but with great difficulty. And eventually, I, the state became the provider. The Department of Health uh, incorporated these uh, facilities, dispensaries, some of them were, mm -hmm. into a state hospital system, which existed within the Department of Health until the 90s, when it was then uh, separated as a different agency, the Hawaii Health Systems Corporation. We're still a state agency, but we're not an executive department of the state. So we are a little bit, still a state agency, a little separate, maybe a little bit like the University of Hawaii in that regard. Got it. And it sort of fits in with the focus on health that Hawaii's demonstrated ever since the 70s with its uh, sort of insurance safety net, the yes. uh, Affordable Care Act. Well, I'm saying the Affordable Care Act is the... <laughs> Uh, interestingly, rather similar, uh, right. more recent national uh, thing. I, honestly, it's it's got many similarities with Hawaii and achieves more or less the same percentage of coverage. Or tries to. Or tries to. We there have been, a very high percentage of insured population thanks to that uh, the law, Hawaii law, which of course came uh, way before the Affordable yeah. Care Act. But I think that law and also the support for my hospitals is something we're very proud of as a state. Yes. We take care of folks in our state, and we think healthcare is important and for everyone and all communities. And part of what I appreciate about my current position is to try to, if you will, kind of even out the healthcare delivery system to improve care on the neighbor islands and to not necessarily be so Oahu centric because our neighbor island communities are growing. And uh, as an Oahu resident, I do hope that's where the most of the growth will be in the future. But uh, from an economic perspective, adequate health care is very important to growth of those communities. And so I think we have a role 
in improving the health care, not that it's not good now, but provide more services in these communities than we have in the past. And we're doing that bit by bit. And we'll talk about some of those services in a minute. I'd just like to say, based on my personal experience, that distances are large, populations are often scattered and small, especially on some of the, uh, well, especially on the Big Island, I would say, but definitely true on some of the other ones also. And I've come to appreciate that the best care is obviously the right care. You have to be able to provide the right care or know when to send that person on or get a resource from outside your facility that you may need. That happen, But that kind of care, that happens closest to home. Uh, people do better close to home. The other thing I, I was, we both seen a lot of change. When I started at Hilo, you could drive from Hilo to Honoka and see sugar the whole way. And when I started at Wahiwa, uh, there was a Wahoo sugar, Wailua sugar, and two pineapple uh, plantations. Um, and there uh, used to be a um, health clinic for Wahoo sugar down in central uh, Oahu and Wailua Hospital, which closed before my time, but not much. Uh, so yes, it's, and Molokai was, of course, mostly pineapple. Um, so it's been a huge change, and these people need a resource, and thankfully the state is providing it. And it's a pleasure to work at these places. You can sit down with people. I had the privilege of uh, visiting with a family and seeing the medical record, the birth record, uh, from the 1950s, in a small, it was in Ho'olehua Hospital. I didn't know there was such a thing. Um, and those records still exist. They were in the Molokai Hospital, a, not a state facility, but a, another small facility. Um, medical record, you could look back 60 years of medical records and trace a life. It was wonderful. And mm -hmm. I could visit with the person. I, yeah. I had a great time. Yeah. Some of our facilities have you know, been around more than 100 years. Kohala Hospital, Samahalona on Kauai. Mm -hmm. I'm probably leaving out one or two, but uh, yes, they've been serving the community for a very long time. And uh, I think that um, getting back to your, the discussion of the services on the neighbor islands, we are challenged because the distances are great, as yes. you say, and the populations are relatively small. Yes. So, you know, in the economics of healthcare, as you know very well, if you, you need some population to spread out the the cost of expensive services or you have to subsidize those services and to some degree this is kind of where we're at but the um, you know sort of evolution of our services is I think commensurate with the increase in population on the neighbor islands and uh, you know the relative influx if you will of uh, different professionals and some of it is the part-time residents but there's definitely increasing demand to have services close to home. And as you said, the outcomes are definitely better. And so we really need to look for ways to bridge those two worlds. Yes, there's a lot of uh, sophisticated specialists with a lot of knowledge on Oahu, but sending patients from the neighbor islands to Oahu hospitals is not always the best thing. So if we can bridge that by bringing some of that expertise to our rural hospitals, then we may have the best of both worlds. I agree. and. The one of the challenges is clearly economic, uh, and part cost is part of quality, so that's not an easy problem to solve. Uh, but another is, if you don't have enough people, even if you were subsidizing, let's say, a specialty services service, if it's not used very much, it's hard to maintain right. the quality of that service. If we we're good at what we do a lot of. And uh, so we need to look at more creative ways of sharing expertise and bringing help to people in isolated areas, or when appropriate, facilitating them going somewhere else, to somewhere right. larger, uh, possibly across the water, uh, and then back again. Because you not only have to go do whatever it is you did, but you have to get them back with support for whatever was done. Uh, and this well, of course, the post-acute care is another big challenge. Yes. And 
we do provide long-term care in many of our facilities. Yes. And in many of our facilities, we are the only providers of specialty long-term care. So for instance, you know, as, uh, at Hilo Medical Center, uh, they have uh, some patients that are there long-term and who are on ventilators. There is no provider in the community that would take those patients. So they, they have to be kept at Hilo and we're glad to provide the service, but that's just an example of where we really have to sort of step in and fill different kinds of gaps in the services that are available in our communities. But uh, I think that um, one of the things that we, like you said, we can work on more is to really narrow the the types of patients that will that go to Oahu. Certainly there are still those who go to Oahu who could have been cared for at one of our facilities. And uh, I, I'm proud to say that uh, several of our facilities have gotten very, very good marks recently in quality measures. Uh, you may know that our Kauai Hospital, KVMH, uh, is a premier award winner uh, with national competition. And I think Hilo is a four-star hospital. So, Really, they're hitting the quality measures, and I think that the communities are seeing that the quality of care provided by our facilities is good, and maybe in some cases better because of some of the things we talked about, staying in your own community. And so I think little by little that uh, has improved the base you know, that we have to work with. But certainly you're correct. I mean, there are certain things. You wouldn't want to have a neurosurgeon that only did three cases a year, even if you had all the money in the world to bring them to your community. And, and, you know, practice matters, volume matters. But the literature shows that that's only one factor. And the other factor is having the time, the time to get the story straight, the time to talk to patients, the time that, and that's really what does contribute to the good outcome, one of the factors that contributes to good outcomes in our smaller rural hospitals. People have the time, they can be more personal, and it doesn't just feel good, it results in better care, as you know. So. I'm glad you mentioned that because, uh, so we staff a bunch of different apartments, all different sizes, and honestly, there's real time pressure at the bigger ones because time is also part of quality, but the ideal is actually uh, being able to spend enough time that you are gonna have high quality service. And the really interesting thing is, you have another advantage you didn't touch on. Yes, you have more time to connect with the patient, admire their birth certificate from 1957 in Ho'olehua and talk with them. But guess what? The staff all know them too. And uh, they chip in. They're like, uncle, remember? Or it's, it's awesome. And so, uh, yes, I think we get better histories. I think we are much more likely to give appropriately personalized care. And together can make a plan. Because there are always trade-offs. It might be that uh, a procedure available, say, only on Oahu might provide some benefit. It also, of course, all interventions have potential for harm, as well as being displaced from your community. And so sometimes we reach different answers than we might in a more urban setting. Yes, and I think that one other factor is that um, it's not always available to just be sent to Oahu. And the economic challenges, even if you, know, you have health insurance that would pay for it, all the ancillary costs that are associated with leaving the island, the family maybe have coming over to support, and all of these kinds of things are sometimes such an economic barrier that people who could use specialty care and whose physicians, let's say, you know, uh, on the Big Island recommend that they see someone on, on Oahu, or they, they refuse because they really just can't afford it. Yes, and whether it's the money, which is very real, or the other pain with transfer, which is very real, uh, or it's a capacity at the tertiary center that is devoted to patients that maybe could have been kept locally. All those things matter. And after the break, we'll talk about some of the options we have to get specialty services into the remote corners of the state. That'd be great. Excellent. Again, this is uh, Much More Medicine, and we'll uh, resume with Dr. Linda Rosen after our break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come bang on your chest, you can be the world, you can be the war, you could talk 
So glad go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master. Don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. I'm Dave Stevens, the uh, host of Cyber Underground, uh, every Friday here at 1 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. And then every episode is uploaded to the Cyber Underground, that library of shows that you can see of mine on youtube.com. And uh, I hope you'll join us here every Friday. We have some topical discussions about why security matters and what could scare the absolute bejesus out of you if you just try to watch my show all the way through. Hope to see you next time on the Cyber Underground. Stay safe. Welcome back. This is your host, Craig Thomas, on Much More on Medicine, assisted, as always, by Rich and Ray, and I'm with Dr. Linda Rosen, the CEO of the Hawaii Health Systems Corporation. And before the break, we were talking about how, I think it's partly the culture of the state, taking care of people with difficulty access to services, and in particular health services in this case, um, but also the challenges. The fact that some of the places that are in the state health care systems are, oh, an hour and a half from Hilo Medical Center. Oh, by the way, there's an active volcano in between the uh, facility in Kau and Hilo Hospital. Um, and you can see vivid fountaining from Hilo Hospital and uh, drive by it on your way to and from Kau. So clearly that kind of thing demonstrates the importance of having services available distributed through the rather vast areas of some of our uh, other islands. And uh, now we're going to talk about some tools and opportunities to provide services, uh, possibly of a more specialized nature, uh, far from Oahu. Yes, Craig, I think it's worth mentioning that technology may be something that will help us with this sort of uh, dilemma that we have of a uh, scattered population in need of specialized services. And uh, one of those tools is what people call telehealth, which is, of course, basically sort of virtual visits where one, the healthcare provider is not physically in the same uh, location. And we have examples of that going on today, although it's sort of the initial uh, steps, not, not widespread, but I do think that this is going to be one of the key uh, solutions and strategies that we will employ in the future to provide more specialized care uh, in our more rural communities. So we have a few examples of that, and you know, for the listeners, often the physician provider will be not even in the state of Hawaii. And that has caused people some concern uh, when some of these projects were initiated in terms of, you know, what people call cultural competency. But it isn't something that, you, that is, you know, overwhelming. It, it can certainly be, um, be dealt with. On the other hand, my hope is that more uh, physicians here in Hawaii will become interested in being a telehealth provider. We have, you know, um, these other physicians because they are working for, you know, companies that provide this service. And we really weren't, didn't have something equivalent here in Hawaii that would sort of step up and say, we want to be the telehealth provider. Now that we are deploying these telehealth services in several of our facilities, I'm very hopeful that, it, that people, it's going to catch on and spread and that when others see what can be accomplished uh, and the advantages that physicians would have, if you think about it, if you're an Oahu specialist, especially if you're maybe one of the newer ones trying to build your practice, you can suddenly have a whole lot of referrals uh, because you're able to provide through telehealth care to uh, patients that you wouldn't otherwise see. And we're also very fortunate, another way our state is very progressive, in that we've had uh, laws that, we have a law that telehealth services uh, have to be reimbursed by insurers at the same rate as face-to-face -face services. And this is very unusual. Uh, when you speak with the telehealth providers who you know, uh, are responding to our RFP to provide services, and you ask them about their billing experience, of course, it's extremely poor. They, they kind of laugh because 
so few payers would pay telehealth in the past. Yes. But this is changing, even Medicare. So Medicare paid for some telehealth services in some areas, like teledermatology in Alaska, as an extreme example. But the, uh, there's a lot of progress being made, and there's been recent announcements that this is probably going to open up for Medicare in terms of paying for a, a larger variety of telehealth services. And that will be important for us. So for me, uh, telehealth has been a little bit like speech recognition. I've been hearing about it for, oh, 25 years. And the comment always was, oh, in five years, this can be everywhere. And then in five years, like, it's in five years, this can be everywhere. However, I think you're right. I think that there's a convergence here. The technology used to be, honestly, not very good, quite expensive, and cumbersome to deploy. We had these big carts. You had to connect with, like, over the web to a cart somewhere else, and then people had to walk to it. That's all over. We've got the cart in our pocket now. It's our phones. And there are secure ways of using them. And especially for visually important uh, specialties, dermatology being the perfect one. <laughs> I can try to describe a rash, or I can send an image. Uh, which do you think works better? Um, but also others. There are um, uh, sort of uh, talk-heavy specialties. I'm thinking here of psychiatry, but obviously history matters in almost every medical condition. Um, and so dermatology is clearly something we'd love to move into because there aren't many dermatologists and they're mostly on a walk loop. Psychiatry is a challenge due to distribution of psychiatrists and congratulations on Hilo's uh, recent launch of telepsychiatry. Very it's, exciting. It's been a huge boon for the emergency department. Figures out who should stay and they can stay at Hilo or who should go, sometimes they have to come to Oahu, or who should go home, which is a huge item. The other program, and I know you have been involved with this from the beginning, although it's not uh, a state project, the telestroke thing has been really good. Mm -hmm. It's not only sort of pioneered and evolved the equipment, but it's gotten people engaged in pulling in a key specialist early, uh, both to help with the decision and uh, on-site treatment, but also to determine who might go for tertiary uh, procedures, because of course, not, you're not doing procedures over telehealth. Not yet anyway. Well, that may be coming with robotics in the near future, but that's not really something we're looking at now. It's more the knowledge piece of it rather than, you know, yes. the, if you will, um, mechanical piece of it. But I think that will eventually come in the sense that you can have a surgeon in a community guided uh, by a surgeon in another community and a, have a sort of a combination. But, um, you know, going back to uh, what would you say, telestroke, uh, for those who may not know what the reason that the telestroke was, I think, so instrumental is that when a, a person is experiencing a stroke, they have a, a window of time to receive treatment. Not all are appropriate for treatment, but those who are candidates for treatment, if they're not treated early, it's, it's not going to be good. So, uh, In fact, it's Dr. the ultimate Cole, thing, right. which is the treatment is more efficacious, delivered, the sooner as immediately it's immediately as possible. The sooner the better. And, and so it's less dangerous. So and both matter. Both more effective and, and less bad outcomes. Yeah. Exactly. And so uh, Dr. Matt Koenig, who uh, is a um, neuro neurologist, intensive care neurologist, yeah. uh, was really instrumental in starting this with a, a grant. And mm -hmm. as he said, the equipment, you know, it's kind of beginning type equipment. But the other factor besides the camera, which enabled uh, the neurologist to, if you will, beam into the emergency department at Hilo and evaluate the patient. And they can evaluate, they can say, lift your arm, smile, you know, do the kind of things that they do in person. The other big enabling factor, which we accomplished about uh, maybe about eight, seven years ago, was the uh, introduction of um, the ability to transfer uh, images between facilities and uh, meaning if I did a CAT scan on you in Hilo, I can send it to Queens in anticipation of your transfer there. Before that, people would repeat studies. And of course, in stroke, the neurologist needs to see the head CT in order to be able to uh, you know, uh, make a recommendation. 
So the combination of the, the camera, if you will, and the image transfers is what enabled this. And now we have the ability to give that kind of advanced treatment pretty much all over the state. Very rapidly. And uh, the numbers, the data really show a difference. Many patients before this effort just basically didn't get you know, the care that they could have gotten. And the, because there's a data collection, times are tracked, and because of this effort, all facilities have improved. And the difference between the facilities that could do it and the ones that couldn't is now pretty much dissipated. I agree. And that actually, is, so just to weigh in on that, we're going to wrap up in a minute, but uh, you don't want me describing to the specialist your CAT scan. You want the specialist to see it. Uh, and related to that, uh, there are some efforts uh, to facilitate sharing of data between uh, different health systems. Mm -hmm. Usually within health systems it works, but not always. And outside of health systems it's like a moat. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're pushing for all the emergency departments in the state to be collected in something called EDIE. So I'll know what happened yesterday at a different facility and they'll know what I did tomorrow at a different one yet. And I'm excited about that. You know, thank you for uh, spearheading these changes. This, I, I'm excited about it. it. There are many other things we could talk about, uh, using paramedics uh, in rural communities particularly to provide care at home or in other settings. It'll have to wait till next time. So we'll, There's always a lot to talk about with you, Craig. <laughs> it's true. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for watching. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. This is Much More in Medicine with Dr. Linda Rosen. Thank you.